Dr. Rebecca, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you for having me. Is the coronavirus going to really hurt the APEC economies? You know, it will take um, time as we watch this whole situation unfold. Uh, for the moment, there's a lot of uh, anxiety, of course, but it's managing it. I'm very confident that the economies that are involved uh, will will work to manage it. It's not a one economy initiative. It's a multi multi economy initiative. And uh, Malaysia, that's hosting APEC this year, they have taken measures to ensure that the the, the officials who will be in Kuala Lumpur in Putrajaya um, are cared for, uh, you know, are, are comfortable and are assured that we are doing the best. That Malaysia is doing the best uh, to ensure that you know we manage the situation, and also to make sure that we don't overreact to to the situation. What do you mean by overreact? Do you think yeah. that the people are overreacting already? I think we have to go back to the World Health Organization stand on this. They were very clear that they were not advocating for a ban on travel, a ban on entry of of. Uh, people, it's they, they were not advocating a stoppage to freedom of movement. So l let's look at this in a very rational way. Let's take on board concerns. Let's work collectively to find a solution. Um, and that's what I mean when I say we shouldn't be overreacting. But there has been actually a restriction on freedom of movement. I think measures that are being taken to prevent the spread, that's, that's more important. Let's, in, it's important to focus on those initiatives. Measures that, for example, Malaysia as host of APEC this year, the measures that they have put in place, the, the reassurances that they've sent out on almost a daily basis to the APEC economies to, to say, you know, you're coming to Malaysia for meetings. Here's what we're doing to ensure your safety, to ensure that you're comfortable, uh, you know, being, being in Malaysia. And, and I think that, that kind of assurance is more important than just an outright ban. What about uh, the impact on economies? Because in the end, that's really also yeah. what people are worried about. Of course, it's tragic when people die from this terrible disease. But on the other hand, it's also, is this going to mean that the world's going to tip into recession? Uh, we have to go back to our experience in SARS, for example. And then also there was some impact. I must, I must say, I mean, it's, it's, to say that there's no impact is, is, is not right. There will be an economic impact, especially to tourism, to the service sector. But the more important thing is what can we do as, as a community, as an APEC community, for example, to deal with this. I think that's, that's where, uh, that's more important. That's where the focus should be rather than you know, looking at the downside. Yes, there will be downsides. Uh, our economies are so interlinked, so it, tourism will be affected, and therefore there will be an impact on growth. Some economists are saying that it really shouldn't be that great a worry because if again we parallel with SARS, uh, there was a short-term impact, but in the long run, everything bounced back. So should yeah. we be a little bit more sanguine about the economic uh, impact of uh, uh, this disease? You know, the, the thing is, uh, around this, this sort of uh, incidences, there is anxiety because people are not sure what's, what, what is the end game, where is this headed? Uh, but Let's, let's look at how we can work together. For me, that's more important. Uh, we have all the past experience, and I think there's enough, enough work being done to find solutions, to find a, a way of dealing with it. And that's, that's where the energy should be. You know? In the case of SARS, China was a much smaller, smaller economy. economy. Yes, that's right. That's so right. one of the more worrying things is that China is now the second biggest economy in the world and constitutes yeah. such a large part, almost 20% of world GDP. So no matter what, mm. if the factory of the world, China, slows yeah. down and all the supply chains begin to slow down, they will, will that mean something you, bad? If you say that there's no impact, that's being completely unrealistic. But 
it's about how we manage the impact and the fact that you know the the scientists the health authorities are collaborating to find solutions i think that's very important also to learn from past experience how do we manage this you won't give an assessment on how you think it's going to hurt I, or not hurt you know i'm not a i'm not a medical person and i follow the news but I'm, from a, no, yeah. from an economic point of from view. From an economic perspective, like I said, if, if I were to say there is no impact, then I'm being unrealistic. Of course there will be. There will be because our economies are so intertwined, um, are so integrated, value chains are so linked. There will be, and, and you know, in the short term, definitely. But what we need to do is to try and work together to deal with the situation so that we bounce back together. Some commentators say that, in fact, uh, cases like these viruses enforce that scepticism about free trade, about free travel, and that we should be actually building walls around us, which seems to have, it's a, it's a sentiment that has been growing over the last yeah. few years, or at least it's more prominent. I'm just going to use Malaysia as an example, and to, to some extent Singapore, we are open economies, and if you track how these economies have grown, it is because we have opened our markets, we have opened our economies, we have encouraged international trade. So the, the question is not uh, whether globalization has brought downsides or, or globalization is the panacea for, for economic growth. That's not the question. The question is how do you make sure that the benefits of globalization, of international trade, of free trade is spread across the economy? That, if as many people as possible benefit from from the benefits, the pluses of international trade. So it is incumbent then on governments to work with the private sector to, to ensure that all the effort that you're putting in to negotiate trade agreements, to keep markets open, that you know, how do how do you make sure that these benefits go down to, to the small and medium enterprises? How how do you ensure that these create jobs? So it is really incumbent on governments to work with the private sector. negotiated many of these key trade agreements for Malaysia. Haven't you ever had an ordinary person off the street ask you, um, you know, Dato, what is it you exactly do? How do you yeah. convince them that so, this trade uh, negotiation really yeah. benefits them? The trade negotiations can be very technical. You're negotiating rules, but what, how, do you, how do you manage these rules? How do you translate these rules so that the person on the street, the small and medium enterprise, understand and appreciate and can tap into and take the benefits from these rules. So it's really, again, I go back to incumbent upon governments to go back and translate this for the SMEs. How do you make sure that the SMEs understand how to comply with these rules? And maybe you know? governments haven't yeah. been doing that good a job at doing that? There's more to be done. I'm sure, you know, uh, there's a whole initiative under APEC called interna internationalization of SMEs. Uh, this is under the Borokai Action Agenda. Because there's a realization that SMEs are so important to all our economies, our, our economies in APEC. And if these economy, I mean, these SMEs don't see the benefit or don't understand how to make sense of FTAs, of the free trade agreements, what are we doing? You know, um, it's, it's, it's not going to benefit anybody and it's a waste of resources and energy if you do that. So translating all these rules so that um, SMEs, small businesses understand how to tap into these benefits is very important. It's as important as negotiating 
the market access for these companies. But back to this, this question, I think that it's, it's almost an existential question though, isn't it? An existential crisis of, of societies now where we don't quite agree anymore. People don't understand how what you're acting, doing, planning directly or perhaps mm. not benefits yeah. this person on the ground. Yeah. So if, if they get better wages. Yeah, there's a lot of noise around globalization, the downside of globalization. But, and so we have to deal with it. I mean, it's important to deal with it. And Malaysia's chair of APEC this year, one of the focus areas, one of their priorities, priority areas is to look at the narrative again, the narrative of trade and investment. I think that's so important because you, you want to look at it and say, um, here's, here's how trade and investment has benefited and will continue to benefit uh, the, our economies. You know, trade and investment is not just about the big companies. Trade and investment is not about big economies bullying small economies. So that change in the narrative is something that we need to do. Can I pick you up on, the, on that point? You're saying about big economies bullying small economies, but doesn't it feel that way to some degree? The US and China are interlocked in this trade war and all the rest of us have to stand at the sidelines and, and watch and then suffer the impact of whatever it is that they do or don't decide. And, and that then exactly is the value of APEC. What, what happens in APEC? APEC is an opportunity, it's a platform for economies, for, for officials, for ministers to sit around the table and hear each other and listen to other perspectives. So it's, yes, bilateral, you have your bilateral issues, but you also have the rest of us watching, the rest of us listening to what's going on and contributing to that conversation. And that platform of, because APEC is non-binding, uh, it's voluntary, it's consensus driven, right? So that is an opportunity for us to hear each other out and to provide a very safe environment for us to discuss issues. But then may I challenge you, what's the point of APEC? It isn't binding. None of these big countries have to listen to us, small countries. Yeah. What's the point of sitting around, spending all this time when they'll just go ahead and do whatever they want? It's always better to be engaged than to be outside the tent, as they say. It's always better to be in the tent, discussing all these difficult issues. In a binding environment, like the WTO, it's harder for us to, to, do, to have this kind of conversations. Whereas here, it's about us preparing the ground for something that we can take back for us to share best practices even, you know, to, to see how we can help each other. You know, you, in, the, in the course of the discussion, uh, sometimes difficult issues su surface, right? And in that process, we say, okay, you know, here's an opportunity for us to help this economy understand my perspective. It all sounds wonderfully idealistic and, and terribly laudable, but does it actually put more food on the table? Does well, it actually create jobs? For example, you are exporting to country A or economy A, and there are a whole bunch of customs regulations. You know, there's no way you can, the, the tariffs can be zero. Okay, we've negotiated an agreement, tariffs are zero, but gosh, the customs rules and regulations just make it so difficult for me to get into the market. Now that's trade facilitation. If I cannot get my goods into an economy, what, what kind of jobs do I create? What benefit will it bring to my people? So that's a very important aspect of the work that's being done in APEC. We're not seeing a lot of that now in the, in the way that people are thinking. Uh, yeah. it, it's become a very you know, a zero sum game uh, mentality where it's, you know, for example, the US talks about bringing jobs back to yeah. America. They're yes. not talking about creating jobs, they're talking about bringing jobs back to America. So if that kind of thinking is the rhetoric that we're getting from large countries, um, doesn't it trickle down to all the rest of us? You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's us looking at what kind of benefits we get from, from international trade. You know, the, 
the economies like Singapore, like Malaysia, we depend on trade a lot more. And that's why this, the whole idea of changing the narrative is so important, changing the narrative on trade and investment. And this year, you will hear a lot more of that kind of conversation going on because it is important that we realize that trade is not a zero-sum game. One of the criticisms that there is of APEC is that India, that very major economy in Asia, mm -hmm. is not included in APEC. Yeah. Why is India not a member of APEC? And can APEC actually function meaningfully without India? APEC is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. If you look at, at how APEC is, it's really economies that border the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it, that's a very simplistic uh, answer. If you're looking at how the members are organized, they are really economies around the Pacific. Now, is, is APEC uh, ready to expand and include other economies? I think that's a conversation that needs to be held at a higher level. And uh, for, for the longest time, I think there was a moratorium on membership. Uh, and this, this subject has yet to be explored. So if at all an economy is interested, well, they flag their interest, and it has to be a consensus uh, decision around, around the table. So all 21 economies must first decide, yes, we want to expand, and two, we are uh, here are the conditions for, for that expansion. Uh, right now, it's, we're not there yet. The APEC argues that one of the reasons, in fact, it was founded was to try and lessen inequality. Yep. But we've seen, in fact, inequality increasing in many countries. The rich own 1% mm -hmm. can own 90% of the resources. Uh, mm -hmm. And the majority still struggle with very little. Yeah. You, How can that change? You know, one of the areas that, that we look at when we discuss uh, issues in APEC, one of the things that comes, keeps coming back is inclusive growth. How do you make sure, and I've, I've said this before, how do you make sure everything that you're doing leads to benefits for the people, for the small and medium enterprises, for youth? How do you make sure this happens? You know, uh, we cannot dictate it for sure, but what we can do is have this conversation among ourselves and what we can do collectively, we can do better to ensure that we include, for example, women. So last year, for example, we worked very hard to ensure that, how do we, how do we include women? Women empowerment sounds very good, but isn't the devil in the detail. Implementation Absolutely. really is what yeah. it's about, right? Yes. And in so many countries, that's not implemented. Yeah. We still see even in developed countries like Singapore, where women are not being paid equally, and it's even more acute in underdeveloped yes. countries, where the yeah. gap is even larger. So a lot of good talk, yes. little action. But it's important to have that conversation. And that's why in Malaysia's year, they will be drawing up a practical implementation plan to and in that implementation plan uh, I, I'm again not preempting it um, but we'll have to include best practices sharing of best practices looking at regulatory frameworks for women uh, that you know that discriminate against women so we need to look at regulations for sure all the laws that may that could discriminate against so you will have it out there if you had a farmer from Indonesia um, sitting in front of you and he says, why should I believe you that trade yeah. is actually good when actually I think I could get a much better price for my rice here in Indonesia if the government would only put up trade barriers? It's not just the saplings that you're dealing with. What goes into your initiative to even grow that rice? It's not just getting the seeds from somewhere and, and just planting. How are you going to move your rice out? All these things come back to uh, 
you know, making it easier to do business. You've got to find the role of government comes in. You know, how, how will I facilitate your access to finance because you need to buy the seeds? How will I facilitate your, your access to fertilizers? How will I help you get your products out from the farm to the market? One of the key initiatives in, in APEC is also about e-commerce and the digital economy. And I, I say this all the time. It's so easy to say, you know, go online, sell your stuff online. It's so easy to say that. But, but how? how? Exactly. That's the point. You know, if, if you don't have access to, to the internet, if you don't have access to mobile technology, how are you going to do it? If, if you don't know how to package your goods, You've been doing this for a long time. You were 35 years yes. <laughs> in the Malaysian Ministry for uh, Trade and Industry. Trade, yes, yes, exactly. Um, do you ever get frustrated? I'm optimist and I firmly believe in engagement. And I firmly believe that we all have a role. And you know, one of the things that, that I impressed upon the, the, my colleagues and I work with is never take anything for granted. Always question why. I used to say, like, if, if you're processing a license, for example, I said, why are you doing it? If we are really going to be, you know, relevant uh, for the business community, for the society, it's, oh, I'm doing this, I have to do this, it's part of my job scope. It doesn't cut it with me. Dr. Rebecca, thank you very much for being on thank your conversation. You. Thank you very much for having it.